Good morning. Thank you for attending the Remit One event, Innovation in Payments and Remittances. In this session, we will be discussing Better Together, building a new global standard for the remittance ecosystem. I am Osama Kasebati, Associate Sales Director at Remit One, and will be hosting today's event. We will have an hour and 15 minutes for today's webinar. For the first 40 minutes, I will moderate a panel discussion with our expert panelists. And then there'll be 30 minutes at the end of the session for questions from the audience. Please leave your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen at any point during the webinar, and we will try to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the session. Before we dive into the panel discussion, just a few words about Remit One, who we are and how we support businesses in the money transfer industry. At Remit One, we assist a range of businesses, including startups, established money transfer operators and banks by providing them with everything they need to start, run and expand their global money transfer operation. We can get businesses up and running quickly by guiding them through the process of obtaining a money service license and a remittance bank account. We provide businesses with leading technology and enabling them to run their entire remittance business, enhance customer service and simplify operations. And finally, we support business growth by connecting our clients to our vast global network that we've delicately nurtured over the years. To start today's session, I'm very pleased to introduce our expert panelists. First up, we have Hugo Cravismore. Hi, Hugo, how are you? Pleasure to have you. Hi, Osama. Uh, Hugo Moore is president and CEO of More World Consulting and Platinum Networks, IMTC Remtech Awards. Based in Miami, Florida, after spending more than 20 years de developing many MTOs, Hugo has become a consultant for a number of financial institutions in the money transfer and remittance cross-border industry across the world. His work as a consultant led to development of the Platinum Network, IMTC, and the Remtech Awards, which all aim to bring innovation to the remittance industry. We also have Siddharth Gautam. Hi, Siddharth, how are you? Hey, how are you? Good, thanks for having me here. Fantastic. Um, Siddharth is Head of Sales at Ada Finance. Siddharth is an accomplished business leader with expertise across fintech, cross-border payments, ICT and tech-enabled businesses with over 20 years of professional experience. Siddharth has managed to grow, start up and scale up businesses to release their full potential across the EMEA and Asia uh, region. Currently Head of EU Sales at Ada, at Ada working closely with international businesses to help them streamline their cross-border payments and accelerate their access to frontier markets. Um, and finally, um, he's not with us at the moment, but hopefully hopefully he will join. Uh, we, have, we will shortly hopefully have Mark Alcock, who's CEO of Engine F. So without further ado, I, I, we'll, we'll go into uh, uh, the questions, our, our panel discussion. And my, um, how we're going to do this is if I uh, aim the, the question at one of our panelists, but obviously uh, you, you can both have, have input and discuss the same topic, uh, please feel free uh, to discuss. So my first one's directed towards Hugo. Um, Hugo, how significant is the remittance industry and who are the traditional and new players in the remittance ecosystem? Okay, so... Good morning, everyone. Um, the, I think the first thing we have to define is really what's, uh, what's remittances. I mean, remittances for the World Bank are only considered worker remittances. And that means the money that a uh, son or daughter or husband or wife sends to the family, like family gifts. So this is around six. 650 to 700 billion dollars a year so is you know is significant let's say for a, a, in size uh, you know on the world trade and world finance it might be, not be you know 
extremely significant, but we have to understand that that is higher than uh, investment from uh, one country into another, and that's much, much higher than the aid that uh, developing countries receive. And yes, it's very significant to certain countries. Uh, how significant? It depends how you, you uh, compare the significance. Uh, so, and that's only recorded remittances. So I have to say that this 650, 700 is just recorded. How much is informal is anybody's guess. Uh, whether it is maybe 30 or 40% more. So we're talking about 1,000 billion. Yeah, maybe. Nobody can say really. It, informal can be estimated for certain particular countries, but not really for globally. It's kind of difficult to do that. So how significant? You can compare it to GD, uh, GDP, the gross national product. And then you can see that there are some countries where it's very, very, very much 30%, 35% of their GDP, like Kyrgyzstan, like um, uh, Tonga, Tajikistan, uh, Nepal, Liberia, um, Haiti is about 30%, Gambia is 20%. So it's really significant because as a, from, for the, from the gross national product is a lot. Even China and India are big, they are huge countries. So the volume is, is very big for those countries, but it's not as significant compared to the GDP. Now you can compare it to the population. You know, if you divide remittances just by the population of one country, then you can determine how significant it is for every, let's say, individual in that country. So if you do that, then Lebanon is number one because it's a, it's a small country, few number of people, and just a huge amount of money every month or every year. So I, you know, when, when we talk about significant, yes, depends on, on where you are uh, and how that, because you can also look at towns. There's towns in Africa and Middle East in everywhere where 70% of the income of that town comes from remittances. So that's major, that's significant. So I'm just gonna leave it at that, uh, Usama. Yeah, absolutely. Means completely uh, agree with Hugo. In few South, Sub-Saharan African countries, it is the remittance is the backbone, you know, specifically the world, uh, there is a word coined by World Bank, which is LMIC, low and medium income countries. So it's a real backbone for a low and medium income countries. Lesotho, Tonga, like it is in high 30%. So it's, it's a backbone, you know, uh, the, the entire country depends upon uh, the remittances. That's the backbone of the, uh, of the economy uh, in few of the countries. So yeah, means uh, for LMIC countries, uh, it, it, it's a backbone, uh, it's a necessity. And that's the, uh, if the diaspora is successful, uh, they will send more and more remittances. And that's, where, that's what we have seen. Like everybody predicted that with the pandemic coming in, remittances coming down, uh, World Bank itself has suggested uh, in high teens, uh, early 20s. But then the 2020 figures is all out. It was just around 11, 10 to 11 percent reduction as compared to 2019. So it's a very resilient industry, uh, you know. Uh, uh, and, and the reason for that is since a lot of people back home depends upon this money. So this is a sort of a necessity for an immigrant when you know working in a country. So it's a resilient backbone of of low and medium income countries completely and totally. Yeah, and I'm going to add something like. Uh, especially because that money goes to the lower fourth or lower fifth of the of the economy. So, so, so you know, when we compare it to GD, GDP or something like that is the whole national product, but for poor families in developing countries is really, as, as, as you say, see, they are the backbone. And, and that's why it's so important. And it doesn't matter how my, uh, migrant families spend their money, there's a lot of studies, whether uh, it goes into consumption, it goes in this and that. The, the truth is that is, is this just a fuel of, of, of those uh, poor people everywhere in the developing world that just uh, depend on them to, to, to survive. It sometimes is it's the same thing, 70, 
60% of the whole livelihood of the whole money that a household has to live on. Yeah, that, 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 that is very, very significant. Um, and in, in terms of, you touched upon Hugo, um, sort of formal and informal, sort of uh, a way to uh, sort of um, calculate and see how much remittance is being sent obviously that's it's easy to do that with a more 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 formal or traditional way and there's a there's an informal way who are the the traditional and new players in that ecosystem more focusing on the um sort of a, a, the traditional and new way look um it, it really depends depends where and uh, and and there's always in remittances there's always a sending market and a pay, paying market. So where the money originates, where it goes. So Sidar was talking about the pandemic. So there was a, a small decrease in certain countries, especially if they depended on Euro. If they depended on the United States, you actually saw an increase, which was completely unexpected. And so the traditional, the traditional sending players have always been uh, agent base, you know, the the brick and mortar operations, your own store. Those are the ones, of course, at the early part of the pandemic, they were affected because people couldn't move, couldn't go to those agencies. So of course, every new uh, digital player uh, saw an increase. And if you go, if you go on, the pay, on the payment side, the same thing, the more digital the payment, so you'll see, you'll see on Africa how uh, mobile money companies saw also an increase because the remittances landed on mobile, on mobile wallets. So um, we, we've seen a transformation. I think it's early on to say what's going to stick and what's going to change. Uh, traditional companies are indeed uh, changing, are indeed evolving uh, in, in, uh, in our my consulting nowadays is, is, is mostly companies that want to, you know, what do we do? Where do we go? Should we close uh, stores? We go digital. How to go digital? It's not easy. It's not easy. And, and uh, how many people are going, went to digital, are going to go back to get, going to, 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 to stores to send money? We, we don't know. I think it's going to, to stick. Uh, certainly, there are fintechs that were predicting that they were going to reach X level in 2025, and they already reached it. I mean, because because of the upsurge in digital. So it's 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 very interesting. I think that is depends on the quarter. It depends where you know if it's UK to Nigeria or 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 wh whatever that corridor is. It has its own transformation because digital impacts differently the sending. And, and the payment side. So I will say that uh, it's, it's very interesting what is happening. I think that companies have really have to look down into the bottom line and said, you know, where, where am I going to be, you know? So that, that's, that's what I would say. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and I would tend to agree where we, we have in the past seen the traditional Asian cash base, cash has always been king. And slowly over the past sort of 10 years, we have seen slowly some innovation being uh, in the market and more digital types. But I think because of the pandemic, it has really um, uh, hastened that uh, people changing over from and getting used to using uh, more new technology. I think as, as we get the second and third generation as well, they are more tech savvy and they are more sort of familiar and then more comfortable to use uh, use new technology and things like that also fantastic um my second question i'm, I'm going to uh, direct towards uh, siddharth um how do you think we can enhance prosper payments through successful partnerships and working together yeah thanks thanks Donna. and first of all apologies guys like a big hello to the uh, you know a good morning to the friends in uh, us who are joining us early morning there uh, good afternoon, uh, still morning between afternoon in Europe and late noon to my friends in uh, Asia. So, and thanks again uh, for having me here, Osama. Yeah, uh, see, to me, partnership, partnerships are absolutely critical. 
okay no one organizations can solve uh, our uh, you know the uh, the issue or the, to facilitate or to change uh, the ecosystem so partnerships are absolutely uh, critical there is no point in reinvent the wheel each one of us has our core competencies it's 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 good for all of us to focus on those competencies and then uh you know align with partners who have a laser sharp focus in in the particular capacity so we at aza is a firm believer in that and you know our partnership with remit one uh, is is just like you know it's a it's an epitome uh, the proof of the pudding is in eating so our partnership with remit one is a proof of that thing like remit one as a platform you guys have a big small medium mtos lot many of them we are the biggest african financial infrastructure organization so you know we join hands there is no point in for me working directly with those 80 of them they are already on your platform so yeah I mean that that's a natural i should say a combination of 1 plus 1 11 rather than you know uh, rather than arithmetic progression that's how the geometric progression and the exponential progression goes so partnerships are absolutely critical not only from a and and the reason for that is if you see a ecosystem uh, as hugo have said like you know apart from the sending and the benefit, uh, receiving country there are five or six big players in in the ecosystem so you have obviously the consumer on both the side the peer on individual on both the side so you have a, 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 a let's say a brick and mortar agent or 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 a digital company then you have got an aggregator like us then you have got a technology provider like you and then th there are so many uh, peripheralia like you know the idm the software uh, uh, the regulatory things uh, where we have to screen aml and cfp and so on and so forth so all these five or six players has to come together to give a seamless end to end experience to the consumer that is very critical okay and and that is where i believe there is no point in reinventing the wheel uh, we have to drive meaningful mm -hmm. and coordinated change at a global level you know over a sustained period of time to make it happen that is where all the players have to come together and and make it more and more meaningful and in fact if i just go back you know uh, to a previous question uh, if if you see the change which is happening in an industry it's very exciting uh, let, let's talk about some recent things you know we all know like remitly have just applied for a uh, uh, ipo uh, valuing them at 5 billion they are one of the early mover in a digital world world remit have acquired wave you know in q3 q4 of last year we all know wise transfer wise wise what they are doing you know going direct on on london stock exchange so that's exciting times uh, pandemic have really really like the brick and mortar business the kind of the growth which they have given to the digital services of the brick and mortar Uh, businesses like last one year have propelled their digital growth to almost equal to of the last two decades that's the kind of the change this pandemic have done um, uh, to the business and that's where uh, the partnerships is there for leverage and and ecosystem is already developed we just need to be open uh, to interoperability is the name of the game in our business uh, for a seamless end to end great experience to the clients Absolutely, absolutely. I do agree. Hugo, do you have anything to add to that, Hugo? Any thoughts on that? I tell you, see, that if you're just right on the money, it it is, it is, it is something that 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 is interesting. And I said um, maybe a year and a half ago that you know partnerships in this space were in steroids. I mean, it's really booming now. You have to understand that traditional companies just. Uh, built they did everything on their own they built their own system they built their own distribution networks all the interconnections they did, they built their own uh, compliance and all this that's what the old way of doing things and that and and if, and for some companies that's difficult to to break that that habit you know i i come to companies and and we discuss let's say their system there's so many legacy systems right now and and sometimes you know my position is <laughs> look you know just just scrap your system there, there, there's no way you're going to be able to redevelop something or you cannot keep on putting you know little uh, bandages to 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 systems so you you just have to you know realize what you're good at what is what is your core competency are you good in the distribution side uh, are you good in technology 
never it's really never is too much you know i but but the competency is customer service maybe distribution networks maybe the branding maybe your brand is very well known in in your area etc cetera, etc cetera. so what are what are you good at what is your big uh thing that makes you different and then the rest of the things you just you partner of course partnering means technology because if you partner you need technologies to talk to each other you need apis that really work and so so you always go back to the technology side and 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 that's that and that's very important to realize because uh, some of those recognition players are having that issue right now, whether I change systems or whether I continue to develop my own and, and how do I do that? And that is that system going to integrate with all my partners and partners, they're partners in distribution, they're partners in the compliance side, in the you know, KYC list, you have so many rec tech fintechs coming in, giving you the opportunity to just tap on them. And just and, and even do it better than you can do it, and you and you will never really be able to to develop something so precise. So everything it's, it's, it's is also this, this, it, yeah. I, th I think you're absolutely right. Okay, just, sorry to jump in there, but it, and uh -huh. it's not just the the, the one-off development that they would have to. It's the ongoing. You'd have to have a whole tech team. Uh, if 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 three of your integrations, some of them do an update on their system. Therefore, you have to now update your system so it keeps in line with the integration that you've done. And that's an ongoing thing, unless you have full teams that are going to do that and are going to look after the technology side for you. Uh, again, while you concentrate, again, what you're good at on your business, on, on getting those, uh, doing the marketing side and on, 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 on making those partnerships and things like that. Um, the tech side, it, it, it can become very, very difficult to manage. And that's why people do work with partnerships. And again, the whole ecosystem, if you think about it, you've got ID verification companies as well in the ecosystem. You've got payment gateways in the, in the ecosystem where you can collect money from as well. And then obviously the pay up on it. So there's, there's all sorts of integrations and partnerships that are happening and, and they all need to be managed and kept up to date. Yes, and, and remittances is one financial service. There, there are many other financial services the same customers are doing. So you have to integrate to those in a way, you know, unless you really want to develop the whole range of products and services, which if you do by yourself, it, it's, it becomes really complicated. I mean, we, we can see what banks are, 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 are doing right now. It's, it's very hard, even the banking uh, uh, software, sometimes, you know, banks come and say to, 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 I need a technology to handle remittances. I need to connect to my core, banking system because we just cannot deal this high transaction volume and do it a very well you know transaction monitoring and all this you need a layer of technology there so it is very interesting how everyone even you know big banks traditional banks uh, or of course the digital banks are built on partnering the new fintechs are built on that idea so 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 those 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 begin with with the knowledge that this is how I, I have to come up with a with a modular thinking, you know, and and even when I discuss compliance, I mean, if you don't develop your system with compliance in mind from the beginning, it's really complex to be able to just go back and, and implement. So so it's a whole uh, way of looking at things. It's just it it really depends on new mentality of looking at this and says how how I partner here, how I partner there. And, 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 you know, partnership is all about a win-win, you know, you have to, you have to really leverage what do you win from a partnership, how do you leverage, how do you make it work for you, and how you set up your company to do what you are best at doing, you know, and it's, yeah, it's all about investing and, you know, realizing your investment and see how, how that uh, should, you know, uh, work in the, in the medium term in the long term etc now it's very hard to think on the long term nowadays because you know <laughs> we we need to be thinking tomorrow you know and and that thinking of tomorrow because everything is evolving you have to be flexible and you have to partner there is no way really for me it's just it, it's just what it is you know and sometimes it it, it takes 
thinking, you know, it, it takes on changing the way you realize your, your future, you know? Yeah, absolutely. If you see, you know, the devil is in the detail. If you crunch the numbers, let's say 50 sub free African countries, mobile money is, is very popular in that continent. And if you see Southeast Asia, uh, India, and the entire subcontinent, uh, that is where the mobile wallets are coming up in a big way. So if you see 50, 55 watt countries, which is primarily a receiving country, you know, and if you have got four or five players in each of the country, you're talking about 200 to 250 new integrations. How, how many engineers you need to do it? You know, it's a perpetual, uh, you'll be perpetually integrating and then one patch update here and there, and then you have to update everything else. So yeah, means it's, it's a no, to me, it's a no brainer. That's yeah. the clear way forward. Like for us is in ASA, we are laser focused on interoperability, how we can have more switches mm -hmm. in sub-Saharan Africa how we can connect to more financial infrastructure. So that's what our core competency is. And we are partnering with, with different last mile payout networks, with the rec tech companies to give the solution, uh, you know, so that the transactions are faster, smoother, uh, so that the great experience happens from a sender side. So yeah, means that to me, that, that's quite not natural. And that's how the in uh, industry is evolving. Now customers expect if you're sending the money, the sender expect through an API, the transaction hit instantaneously. Gone are the days. I'm not saying cash is dead, but that's still in the bank and the mobile wallet. Uh, that, that, that's what this last 15 months have changed for the industry. Absolutely, absolutely, I, I, I agree, I, I definitely agree. Um, my next question is a uh, target towards Hugo, but again, so that please feel free to, to jump in on. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this one too. Um, can you provide an example a specific example of a, success, of a successful partnership and why they work. How do I foster a good working partnership? How do I go about this? Well, uh, one thing in, in our industry is that uh, the most important partnerships that we have is really with banks, with banking. And, and I have to say that sometimes we don't take it into account, but really, um, it, especially in, because of the risking, it's been hard in some markets to really have good banking relationships. And also, you know, banking is being transformed by all this, you know, so, so yes, there's a development of new banks, paying banks, et cetera, et cetera, but both in the sending and the receiving markets, your, I feel that the, one of the most important partnerships is, is, is where your banking institution, because you, 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 money has to come in and out. Of course, now we have crypto, and and then the relationship becomes with a with the exchange, you know. But it's the same thing. You need you need to to provide that 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 flow of funds in the collecting or in the, in the disbursement side. And and if you you know if you are cross border, you're always dealing with foreign exchange. So you need to be able to be very good at managing, you know, currencies and the, and, and the small changes here and there. So, so I will say that that's a very important partnership. How this, that partnership um, is able to exist and, and survive any, anything that happens between uh, that partnership, where, which I consider certainly difficult for certain markets, it's, it's, uh, it's transparency. Is, is, is how much you really uh, sit down and be very honest in this is what I am, this is what I do, and this is what I need from you. Are you willing to, to, to you know, go this and provide those services? Uh, so for me, that, that's one thing. Now, partnering means you have to organize, be organized in what you do. I, you know, work with uh, as a consultant so i talk to to companies and when when partnership doesn't work is really a lack of organization procedures it has to be very clear it, it's, and it's the same thing with technology because i will i'm going to go into a successful partnership with your technological provider you have to be very clear on how you use the system the organization the procedures and sometimes there is administrative or compliance procedures that are not very clear in place. So for me, a successful partnership means really a very good understanding of both parties. 
And that understanding uh, springs from knowledge and knowledge, the transparency of what do I do, what I do, how I do it, and, and, and let me show you how I'll do things. And I have to be very clear and, 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 and I know CDART will, will interject here but because I know ASA pretty well. And I know that, that, that you guys are like, you want things to be organized. Okay, this is what I provide. What do you provide? These things. And, and I'm saying something that is totally logical and you and, and all the participants that are here probably say, you know, if that, that, that's, you know that's what it is. But it goes to those fundamentals, really. It goes to the fundamentals of a partnership and it's just like that in, in everyday life is you have to be very organized and very transparent about what you want, what you expect from the other side and what you what you're willing to 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 put into the into table and this the, the effort that you have to put for that partnership to work. So banking technology and of course distribution channels, that will be the third the third part like. Like when is a company, I realize this is what I am. This is the partnerships that I need. The, the partner has to be very clear on why you need, you need that partnership with you. And it has to work both ways, you know, a partnership works both ways. So that's what I will say. And I will leave uh, Siddharth who is, uh, his brain is going in a thousand miles. Come on, yeah, we'll interject we'll have here. Yeah, you touch base upon TAC, partnership in tax, banking, and, uh, you know, distribution, last mile. I would like to explore a little unexplored area, you know, here, which is the marketing, you know. So, a lot of, like, we we being the, uh, you know, uh, the biggest non-bank currency provider in Africa, AZA, uh, at times we get, uh, and Africa as a continent, if you see overall, it's one of the, apart from Southeast Asia, is one of the biggest uh, receiving market. So we get a lot of requests from people, uh, from the MTOs, specifically small and medium MTOs who wanted to expand in Africa, but then they have got no you know, knowledge. They don't have any data points or hardly any data points. Uh, they don't have those resources like the big daddies of the business wherein they can hire a marketing research or, 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 or have an agency. That is where you know, the partnership uh, comes into play. So not only we give them like you know, uh, uh, aggregator, last mile liquidity, we also help them in pointing out like, you know, what are the Google analytics, how to reach the diaspora in their uh, center country for those specific markets for Nigeria, Ghana, for that matter, whichever, you know, market is uh, where, where we have a core competency. So I, I also feel like marketing, that is where you explore the unexplored. And that is where, and, and these MTOs, they don't really, you know, wanted this from us. It takes the partnership to the next level from a basic satisfaction to a delight. And that's where a long-term relationship get forged, you know, over a period of time, because they don't expect an aggregator or, or a financial interoperability guy, organization like AZA to help them out in terms of targeting, you know, uh, uh, the audience as well. So that's where I feel, you know, marketing is also um, specifically when you are, uh, when, when the idea is to expand uh, into other countries quickly and and fast rather than and 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 that that's also uh, is a very very important uh, parameter from my from my side yeah so thank you so much for input um so sort of, i'm actually going to uh, my next question is aimed towards you i think you've kind of answered the first part but not really the second part why should i look for a partner opposed to going alone which we've kind of answered that but how can I tell a good partnership from a poor one? So partnership, see, uh, again, uh, as you know, further building upon what Hugo have touched, I means we already touch base upon this uh, in a sense that it's, it's very clear as to where, what is my core competencies, organization core competencies, and where I can partner, where I can leverage somebody else's competency. It's, 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 it's a mix and it's, it's a marriage between two equals. And that is how it has to come on a, on a common platform uh, for everybody. So uh, like 
I'll give you some challenges first. You know, like uh, we are a regulated industry. I uh, make no mistakes. Uh, you, you just can't partner with uh, with anybody. So, uh, so you need to see the regulatory perspective as well. Uh, whether the partner now, when I'm saying regulatory, it could be MSB license. It could be uh, ISO 27001. It could be PCIDSS plus certification, and so on and so forth. So you need to be very clear as to you know your partner is is certified or regulatory clear and sort of once that is done that is a hygiene you know that is a basic of any partnership in our business uh, what you need to see is how scalable that partnership is okay so today probably the business is like you know before pandemic who thought and and make no mistake guys our business is a or money remittance industry is a very very fragmented industry the top three players just have got high teens market share around 20 25 percent not even 25% market share, around 20% market share. We have a long, long, really long tail, you know, of, of uh, the operators. And every day uh, you have got new players coming up, uh, primarily in the digital space. In brick and mortar, it's difficult to scale up, but in digital, you can, you know, quickly launch uh, uh, in, in a span of few months. So for successful partnership, it is very, very important to understand what is your core competencies and, and what you wanted to, aspire and achieve by having that partner on board with and the scalability part of it so just don't think what is going to happen today we need to have a vision of as to how uh, you know i'll give you a small example we uh, without taking any names we have one of the big mtos on board we started with them great going suddenly they start pushing volumes and then we realize that our partner which is supposed to screen the id verification they are not as fast you know, they are taking time and hence the transactions were in lurch, you know, they are pending, which is which is not being accepted by my partner, by my other center partner. So quickly, you know, that is where the learning curve also happens. And that is where you quickly assemble, uh, you go in a huddle and, and decide what is the real way forward. So yeah, means TAC uh, is a clear thing, compliance. And to me, one of the major, major thing of a successful partnership is how scalable your partnership is. Is it is it future proof? It's okay for today, but will it be? Will it suffice uh, um, uh, six quarters or eight quarter down the line? No, I, I, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I can totally agree with that. Where some people in the past they have <clears throat> chosen certain providers, and um, and they want to grow their business, but again because they've used. As a, a maybe a tech provider that they're unable to scale with them it's very hard for them now to again uproot everything uh, their whole business take their whole clients and, and move them over to a system that they can scale and that is uh, it's, it's it's rather than start with someone who's able to scale for them again they've gone with someone who's slightly small or built their own system again further on down line they have they've had issues because it's it, it, they're not able to scale then they've had to uproot everything and change everything and move all their clients over uh, 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 to someone that is able to scale for them again it's, it causes more uh, more sort of headaches further on down the line and can, can cause quite a few issues uh, but definitely yeah, looking yeah. for those for those better partners is, is, is preferable yeah. you could you know Simon partnerships sometimes don't work and that's fine you know we it, sometimes I I, I I speak with companies I said look it, it's like anything in life sometimes it works and so sometimes it doesn't it's not sometimes it's a failure is sometimes that also also companies change and you have to be flexible to see where the market takes you and maybe uh, you you need to get rid of a partnership because you're going a different way you know so, so flexibility, you know, is something that you, you, you must have in this market. Who could have predicted where that COVID was going to happen and where it was going to take, take us? Nobody. So, it's, it, it, so this, this, this difficulty that we have seen with the pandemic is what is going to happen? You know, it, 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 it's making it harder for everyone to plan in, in the long term. That's what I mean. So. Yes, you need certain flexibility. Scalability, great, is very, very important. And be flexible about how you set up your structure that you're, you're able to work. Of course, the bigger you are, the more integrated you are with your tech and et cetera, et cetera. Of course, it, it was more difficult to, to move around, to be flexible. 
but flexibility is part of the game in everything we do nowadays. Even, even us as, as people, we need to be able to, to be flexible, to adjust, you know? And I've seen it through, through COVID, how, how, how you need to you change. Even, even, even I, I think all of us have been thinking of that, you know? Look at the back and should I be the same one that I was before, you know? Well, what's my new thinking? So flexibility is the name of the game. And look, if a partnership doesn't work, just, just, just change it. The good thing about this is there's a lot of possibilities right now. It's so open. There's so many new ideas, fintechs providing this and that. And sometimes it's hard. You have so many possibilities, but yeah, you have to choose, you know? But, yeah, but, this, but, this kind of goes yeah. on to my, ties into what I want to ask you next. I mean, I want to get a few more questions out. And I think we've got, and I think this is 35 or a few minutes. Um, it ties into my next question when we, uh, what you've just spoken about about new technology and, and new ways of doing things um you go what type uh, what are the developing trends in our ecosystem and what is ras ras what is ras that's sort of a new yes new service isn't it <laughs> that, that and and this is this is so interesting because um he has taken some time to to get hold of the market, uh, remittance as a service, payments as a service, even banking as a service exists nowadays. In where you, uh, these new partnerships imply that maybe your technology company uh, can do more for you because maybe it's licensed or because uh, it provides the whole range of compliance products that you don't need to develop yourself. All of this have led to. Uh, new ways of doing business. And, and for me, uh, I've been watching this develop and I've been watching regulators go about this, which means, for example, if you need to enter a new market, let's say you have a good brand in Southeast Asia, in Africa, and you want to uh, do business in the, in the UK, maybe you, know, you can partner, you can put your own brand in a product, in an app, in a mobile wallet and it's, it's your, your image. You can, you can be, you can give that company, that's why it's called remittance as a service. You know, I give you my brand, we do a partnership together and the pain, I'm in the pain side, all those remittances come to me, but to my client on the UK or in Europe or in the United States, is my brand really who's in front of the client? So it's, it's my brand and, you know, depending on what the regulator wants to see, you know, powered by X, Y, and Z. And that's, that's, that's new. I think that's, uh, that's coming strong. That's really going to change the market. Uh, and, and, and so there are companies that, that have decided, you know, I have, a, I, I have this, I have that. Why, don't, why do I need to put my... My, my brand on top of everything that I do if I'm a back, a back office operator and I do that really well. So why don't I leave that for someone else to put the branding uh, on the app? And, uh, and that is going to let a number of brands that maybe are not in the financial sector, maybe in the retail sector, maybe in some that will say, look, you know, migrants, migrant families, those are those are my target customers too you know why don't i do this why don't i like so it's 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 very interesting uh, what is happening it's interesting that regulators have understood that uh, as a way of doing business and 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 they're coming up with all, also in ways to to make that happen because whatever what every regulator wants in a way is is better service and lower cost you know, and a more compliant uh, financial system. And, and look, there's some countries doing a lot of things to control the, the amounts of money, the volumes of money of, 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 of remittances because the remittance system has become so good that it's being used for things that were not meant to be at the start, is investing, for example. So of course, Paying, paying people, paying, sir, paying people that are working for you in other countries is more like B2P. 
So, so, so I see this whole thing transforming because cross-border payments is happening everywhere. Not only remittances, you have you you have payments going on through the remittance channels. Some you know some regulators wanted to have be in a different channel because they have different volumes. You need to be complying in a different way. So for me, this is just, just a great surge of new services happening. So, so I, I see this, this partnering, this being able to, to the same thing we've been talking since the beginning in this is, is, is partnership and how good are you and what do you do and provide the other with whatever you, you're good at. That's, that's my point of view. Really, really interesting stuff. Thank you so much for you. And of course, uh, all these things that we discussed, uh, uh, Hugo and, and Platinum Consulting can assist with finding out more information. Um, uh, Siddharth, um, just a, a question for you, uh, to our, our last question, I think, for, for the panel session. Um, how can remittance fix the gig economy and how to participate? Oh, that's my favorite. <laughs> we, we all are hearing this word, word gig, gig economy, you know, uh, what actually it is, okay? So, but before we come in, so before we come into it, let, let's talk about some stats. Uh, one, as of 2020, one uh, in 10 person in UK is employed by this gig economy. The equivalent figure of US is around 8%. By 2024, one in four people which is 40% of the workforce will be in the gig economy. And how can remittance solve the problem? Let me give you a real use case. Let's, uh, and, and Hugo talked about B2P, you know, uh, as one of the use cases. Let's talk about Uber. You know, we all know Uber. Uh, it it requires no introduction. Uh, uh, Uber driver in UK gets paid on their bank account. You know, yes, in UK, everybody have a bank account. Or let's say 99.9% .9 of a Uber driver should have a bank account in UK. Now let's shift this problem to Africa. Lesotho or Tonga or some other nondescript sub-Saharan country. Any which way, overall in sub-Saharan Africa, almost one third or 40% of the people doesn't have a bank account. Now, how does, uh, and, and these Uber drivers, they are at the bottom of the strata. How will Uber pay to them? Or for that matter, how will Telegram pay to them? Or how, for that matter, how will Airbnb will pay to them? You know, um, so that is where uh, the, the, this whole idea of mobile money, and, uh, you know, uh, wallets come into play. That's what really gig economy is doing. And up till now, what is happening, either these people are getting left out or if you are sending money through the traditional, if they do have a bank account, you're sending the money to a traditional Swift channel. The charges are not transparent. You have what under correspondent bank charges. It takes ages. These guys are not very wealthy. It takes ages for money to, you know, for, for, for you and me sitting in US and UK, it's very easy. You do a transfer today from UK, US, next day morning, you'll get the money. But for Africa, it's, it's not like that. At times, you'll be surprised it takes five days, seven days for a money to reach uh, to the recipient. And for them, then it is a matter of survival. It's, I mean, it, it, it depends on the intermediary bank. The intermediary bank might hold yeah. the payment up. It might have its own checks. And then you have your 20 pound, $20 charge from the intermediary bank. And, and then it gets there later. I mean, yeah, and, and if we're talking small amounts. That, yeah, and not only that, like in certain parts of Africa, like let me give an example of Francophone Africa. One Zof currency for seven countries. But the surprising part is those seven countries bank does not talk with each other. There is no common switch. Okay, so if if you have to send the money from, for example, Senegal to, for that example, Burkina, it's the same currency. You know, so the trans naturally we all feel the transfer should happen like this. No, even it takes T plus two, T plus three between intra uh, uh, Africa trade. That is where uh, the you know organizations like us and or or other organizations they have to play a important role in the gig economy so that these people should get the money faster quicker because that's that's the way forward. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I mean, if you think about Europe, Europe, Europe built the SEPA. We have the single European payment arena, the SEPA. That that, that that's next day guaranteed. Uh, between us and the US, we have the cable. Uh, it used to be back in the day a literal cable that used to run on the the sea between us and and the US, and that's how I used to communicate. And literally, we have the cable network that we use between them, which is which is up and running. Put anything outside of the cable network, you're starting to use intermediaries and things like that, which could get a bit a bit tricky. But definitely, Africa needs to sort. Of, we we need to sort of look at a a, a, a standardized again, like we have the separate networks on Africa type network like that. And I, I think it's going to make make those cross border 
payments much more easier and and and, and cost effective for everyone. Absolutely. Definitely. We have some questions from the public. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, we've got um, for some, for uh, last half an hour, we've got just under half an hour now. We've got a couple of questions from uh, uh, from the audience. Um, first one's from Vinay Ratan. It says reduction in cross border charges track benefits refunds instantly. Okay, I'm not quite sure if that's a question. Uh, okay. Direct transfer student overseas education funds to university account. I think he actually elaborated on that in, in this one. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Vinay from India. Uh, my question can transfer student education funds directly to university accounts directly and easy? Track funds immediately. Hmm. For family maintenance remittance now in India, there's a capping of seven lakh above there is a flat charge of five percent. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take it. So what happened yeah. in India is India have, uh, in October 2020, they have uh, announced a new regime, which is known as LRS, which is liberalized, liberalized remittance regime. So in that regime, and, and India is a very good use case, you know, there is a $80 billion of inbound remittances, but then at the same time, there is $20 billion of outbound remittances also, primarily for travel, primarily for student education, which we shall have mentioned out here. So what happened in, uh, in, in, in this regime is like, you know, when you are sending the money, the government is uh, taking some tax uh, uh, collection at source, you know, it, it, it's a sort of a revenue generation mechanism for a government. And it is a very recent legislation, which has happened in Q3, as I was telling, in October, 2020. So, you know, like in, uh, just to give you like this use cases of India, but then we in, our, uh, we in Aza, we are supporting, if, if a Nigerian or African student have to pay to a UK university or a US university, they can just log on into our platform, the parent can log into our platform, create account, and then through that, they can transfer the fees, uh, you know, directly to the, foreign university and i believe uh, so this is what we are doing in africa i'm sure there are organizations in india who are using the or who are doing the same services uh, and i i know for sure that uh, transfer wise which is not wise they have done it they have started it around a couple of months back they have restarted india and they are offering the services so yeah means it's it's natural uh, so banks i you know, the onus is on incumbent, the legacy system, the onus is on them to up their game. Otherwise, the business will move away to the digital players like us or to our, you know, uh, peer group, which is very, very agile, where the money transferred instantaneously. So, yeah, means that's how uh, it, it, it's happening. So, to answer Vishal, yeah, it is possible. You need to shop around a bit, my friend. Uh, it, it is very much there in India. You can directly use one of the one of our peer companies. We are not there in India, unfortunately, as of now. But then you can use one of our peer companies and, and you can use them for transferring the fund to US directly. Thank you for that. Um, I've got I wanna, I, yeah, I want to say something, uh, Osama. I want to say something because it, 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 what, what's happening, and, and this is to just... Uh, discussing a little bit more the gig economy the gig economy remember that something that is very interesting is that of course people want to migrate to you to europe or to united states or even to a neighbor country because it's it, there's more work or you think things are going to be better for you but there's so many people that are staying in their countries and are working for foreign companies I mean, we know call centers, that's one of the, uh, of the beginnings of that. But right, nowadays, there's so many people in Philippines, in the rest of the world, working for companies in Europe, in, and these people need to be paid. And some of these payments are going through remittance channels or modified remittance channels, which I call them, because, because so it's, it's still is cross-border, uh, transfers and or cross-border payments and 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 you know regulators are having a, a, a difficult time saying should I just do is the same regulation for everything these are different this is our, our not gifts this is our these are payments is uh, should we see them different you know, in my talks with regulators try to say look it's better just to have the same the the, the same framework for all 
you just have different different uh you know depending the volumes you may have certain controls if they're business payments but you know business payments then become involved in import and exports so we're dealing with all of that you know we're dealing with with, with a growing cross-border economy in in where remittance companies have the traditional we have done that for a long time and we have done it through through thick and thin you know just apply our technology we know how to we we have the systems in place you know so so these things uh, from the question i was thinking you know uh is some of these new developments sometimes take uh more time to get hold in certain quarters sometimes is because the structure of the quarter and sometimes it's regulation you know and 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 regulators are not having an easy time to look at all of this and say you know how do i deal with that technology is going much faster than than regulation and 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 so so sometimes yes costs are high i i think things will move even faster faster as we move along and we move along uh from the pandemic in making it easy easier and more cost effective and 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 prices will go down and that will imply that companies have to become more more lean and more determined to really be more efficient at what they do yeah could couldn't agree more Google with you you know we we all have seen just day before yesterday fca the uk regulator have uh have given the verdict that they will be putting more resources in terms of understanding the need of uh, uh you know the crypto uh you know currencies yeah. for a cross-border payment so yeah regulator is aware of this fact uh you know uh we have seen first latin country to regularize crypto as a payment <laughs> just, just a couple of weeks back so but yeah at at the other hand if you see nigeria they stopped uh, the crypto you know they banned sort of you know quote unquote so you have seen the regulators are getting progressive day by day in terms of understanding the needs because that's where the the world is uh, moving and that's what the future is so but the question is whether it's going to happen in 2024 or it's going to happen in 2030 uh, that's anybody's guesses but then we are definitely moving in that direction Actually, thank you so much for input. Um, trying to cover just two more questions from from the audience. Um, I think this one is more towards you, Siddharth, from Baba Mukhtar. Uh, what role do remittance companies play in the cross-border payments of school fees within West Africa? Sorry, can you repeat it? Where is this? Sorry, I. What role do remittance companies play in cross-border payments of school fees within West Africa? Yeah, so the cost is like, you know, okay, let's talk about the biggest economy of West Africa, for that matter, Africa, Nigeria. It's the biggest economy, school fees, you know, it's a dollarized economy. We all know in that country, there is a official rate and then you have a parallel market rate. Some people call it black market, we call it as a parallel market rates. So yeah, I means school fees, the cost out there is, and, and you have got so many BDCs out there, Bureau Day Change. You go there on the high street, you will find every person have their own different rates. Liquidity is an issue. So yeah, uh, in terms of a cost, I, uh, you know, it, it, it's around a couple of, uh, around 200 basis point, uh, two to 3% should, is the cost in that uh, country. In fact, in the entire West African uh, uh, countries, it is around two to 3% is the cost of uh, sending the school fees or the university fees to the western countries and and people there are operators like we are very placed we are very well placed for that market and that is uh, you know a lot of individuals are using us uh, for doing uh, that sort of a use case in west africa as a matter of fact thank you very much for that um well for you go uh, actually uh, i'm from qatar representing a bank in sri lanka my major objective is to establish tie-ups with money transfer organizations, exchange centers. But people are moving away from exchanges to mobile service providers who possess remittance facilities. Does this mean your typical MTO are diminishing businesses in a few years' time? Look, everybody 
every company is looking at their bottom and <laughs> say, what do I have to do? Um, I think there's a lot of transformation and, and I, I, uh, the, the description of companies, description of services, you cannot nowadays really put people in certain categories, you know, so, so, uh, uh, what is MT an MTO a money transfer operator now, which what it was 10 years ago is a different thing, you know, so there, and because we've been talking about partnerships, everybody's partner in one way or another. Yes, there is going to be a lot of transformations as, as, as the gentleman asking or the person asking the, the question. So I, I will say, yes, mobile money definitely is, is like, like, like digital sending, fintechs uh, are, are transforming the market, you know, who is going to get ahead? I think there's, there's room for everybody because the market also grows. So, so I, I, I don't, I becoming a per, I mean, I always have known for being able to predict what's going to happen next. I'm becoming more and more concerned about predicting because it's just getting harder. And I have to be very honest about that. It was, you know, so when I, when I see other consultants or, or industry experts talking about, you know, how they foresee the future, you know, every, every, every way is foreseeable, you know, but it's just getting so much diverse. There's so many currents happening and, and you know, who can predict what crypto uh, and, and blockchain is going to do to the, to the money transfer world? We don't know. It's, it's integrating. Right now, most of, of, of crypto in the in transfer space is being used by as an exchange way of making payments in certain parts because it's just easier or you maybe get a better um, exchange differential if you use crypto or because because banks cannot give you that flexibility but but it is it is it is, it is hard to predict what is going to happen yes when you look at one corridor is easier i mean globally almost you can't there's there's no way you can really uh, say what's going to happen globally i i can't myself so yes you look at a corridor and you say okay this is the corridor from from this place to this place what is happening yes you can predict some but you really need a deep knowledge of that corridor and 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 nobody really knows every quarter so many so many differences so many things happening so I, my, my answer to that even if i extended it is this is that every quarter has its own uh is impacted by technology regulation and participants in this in this market uh yes mobile money definitely is 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 here to stay and grow and but it's also I, I see that it started being being shifted to different things, you know. So so it is it, it is part of the space. It will grow, and how do you adjust to that? Depending what institution, how do you partner with them? That will be the name of the game in the in, in the in the next few years. True, you know. Let me let me give you one example of the biggest mobile money uh, corridor, Kenya. We all know it was an early mover. Uh, advantage. Kenya was the first country, M-Pesa to be very precise, was the first mobile money uh, uh, in, in early 2000 because the country was under bank. And you'll be surprising to know like overall around 10 to 12 percent of remittance has gone down. But for Kenya, it has increased by around 10 percent. They are expecting uh, uh, the remittance in Kenya to go up to 5 billion uh, in 2022. Now, having said that, I don't agree with Buddhi when he's saying that people are doing directly to the mobile money. It is increasing. Definitely, there is no two thoughts. But I believe MTO will also up their game. Like, I'll give you an example. Not, not many people know that French regulator have already allowed stable coin for remittances. You know, and, and it's we are not talking about some third world country. We are talking about France, which is the G5 nation. Their regulator have already allowed stable coins to be, you know, packed against uh, or, or to be taken as a uh, paying currency for a for a for a payout in whichever part of the world you want. So I believe 
MTOs will up their game. They will not, you know, lose their territory to the to the telco operators or to the MNOs, uh, primarily in in East Africa and and in West West Africa, where mobile money is a phenomena. They will up their game. Regulators are getting more and more progressive every passing day, every passing week, and I believe uh, the overall size of the pie will increase, and that is how we will see everybody will grow uh, in this market. I agree. I agree. Osama, you are on mute. Oh, that's right. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Attentive. Thank you very much for voicing out. Um, just before we do wrap up, so just just one one more question for you, please, if you don't mind. Um, with this push for digitization, do you see the rise in payment gateways in Africa, or will innovation come from mobile network providers through techs like USSD to facilitate digital payments? It's a very good question, I must say, from Amir. See, uh, I it will be a mix of both, but to be honest, like again no offenses to anybody airtel africa have just sold their mobile money unit you know around two months back and if i tell you the valuation of that mobile money unit you all will laugh okay <laughs> so so i i don't think so like the mobile network operators the mnos as we call it and i am from that background you know i am i worked in vodafone for donkey years so i am from that background uh, i don't think so mobile network operators will do that Yes, it is a it is a piece of their pie, but they are more focused on their core data, voice, VAS. That's where their bread and butter of the organization is, and that is clearly reflecting in the uh, you know uh, in the spin off which Airtel Africa just did around uh, uh, six weeks back or eight weeks back. Uh, the innovation will come from fintechs, and you know since Aza is very deeply entrenched and very deeply penetrated in Africa, almost every day I talk to one or two companies in 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 Africa, uh, and that is where I feel the fintech out there in that continent is doing a, a truly humongous work, uh, and that is where the true innovation will come, whether it is in the banking front, or it is in the tech front or in uh, it's 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 in front of end to end you know i i call it cradle to grave <laughs> kind of a management customer life cycle management but fintech will have a great role to play uh, yes uh, mnos will also uh, do their part but then i don't think so they they have got a mindset of a they have a legacy mindset it's little the inertia is little too high for them uh, they are not as nimble and agile and as flexible as google have told uh, I believe fintech is the is the way forward in in Africa. Okay, okay, fantastic. Um, I'm just checking. We do actually have a couple of more minutes, um, so I'll, I'll I'll see if I can dig out a couple more. Maybe another question. Dosama, uh, uh, the, there's one here. Compliance on KYC is still a challenge for many businesses in remittances. What companies you know that have deployed scalable strategies around this and the tools? Please do pick that up for, for me, you guys. I know that's, that's right up your alley, isn't it? Well, you know, uh, I mean, we just came out of doing a, a Reclients event. It was a virtual event on Rectech. And, and it is amazing what uh, Rectech is doing. And it's right where we're talking, just what Sidat said, is FinTech. And, and, and there's so many... Uh, compliance uh, companies, uh, rec tech companies in the compliance space or regulatory space that it, I, I wouldn't even take on, on, uh, on naming names because there, there, there are some of them who, who are trying to be, let's say, global, but it's a still, it's a still a very diverse market and, 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 and depends what, what corridor you are in. Uh, and, 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 and of course, the technology behind uh, uh, we know how how uh, remit one system has been built to be able to integrate with with Rectech because you you can have an API you can you can do it almost instantly etc cetera, etc cetera. so I, I, and and even 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 the 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 the, the Rectech that 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 uh, remit one has integrated in their system so you you really need to know exactly you know. What is your corridor? What is your challenge? Is a challenge of KYC in your sending markets? Okay, yes, you have to do check checking KYC of in in the sending market, uh, especially if you say UK or 
or U.S., it's, it's easier. There's databases that know people, even if migrants are, are, are is a little bit more, dif more difficult because of the transient nature of, of migration. But look, I think there are solutions in place uh, in almost every quarter. And, and if, if, if there is not one in place right now, there are certainly some people in fintech saying, this is where I'm going to put my finger on. So I'm not going to name any companies, but I'll tell you, uh, uh, it, it shouldn't. It, it is not the challenge that it was. There's a lot of development in in, in direct tech space that uh, that and, and even the technologies around direct tech, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, blah blah blah. Of course, the more developed the market, the the the, the better these companies are to taking that data and integrate and giving you information. But this is a whole space that is really benefiting this industry and making everybody more compliant and and and, and doing business safer than, than it used to be, you know. So that will be my answer to that question. Yeah, absolutely. You got and I definitely agree. Um, Suki, your question about compliance, it, it does depend on, on, on where you are a little bit as well. As as Hugo mentioned, depending on where you're based, um, again, UK, US, we do have uh, EKYC. Uh, companies that have these large databases that you can plug into uh, so within an instant they can uh, they can check validity of ids and and, and things like that um there are the sanctions list as well that you should be or your core system should be connected to and should be checking uh, depending on, on on the area that you that you operate in uh, depending on the regulatory body they might require you to check each and every payment on the ofac sanctions list on the defac sanctions list or the or the un sanctions list and, and obviously uh, as part of compliance, your system must be able to do that every time someone makes a makes a payment, um, and that's how you overcome these challenges uh, uh, by having the technology in place and making it more seamless and making it more easy. As uh, exactly as Hugo mentioned, um, and so just to sort of reiterate exactly what you said there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, allow me to take this one last question in ten seconds. Amir have asked a very interesting question: Why hasn't the M-Pesa model realized success in other regions in Africa? You know, so Kenya is a case study of mobile money. The, anybody in the mobile money industry have read it as a case study. It still is a case study. So Amit, to answer your question, there are two very important things uh, you need to understand that. When M-Pesa did this mobile money thing in early 2000, that is when uh, the, the region was further underbanked. People doesn't have a bank account and they have a first more advantage. You know, they... Uh, Mobile, mobile wallet was there so 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 you know the banking reach slower and the mobile telephony reach faster uh, in in those part of the africa and that is where everybody in up to the village level have an access not an access to a bank but they do have an access to a mobile money wallet and that is how it really happened one very important thing which not many people emphasize on is and which is a fact when mpesa did it when safaricom did it in kenya they have got an obscene, almost close to 75% to 80% market share. Okay. There is no other country in the world, whereas one MNO have got almost 75 to 80% of the market share. Even still today, Safaricom have got almost two thirds of the market share in that country. You know, so, so it, it's like first more advantage. Uh, you move to that country in Kenya and, uh, they have got obscene market share of almost 80% and full kudos to them. You know, they have 80% because they deserve that <laughs> kind of a market share. And that is how the mobile money penetrated in Kenya to be very particular, M-Pesa, what we call uh, in that parlance. No other uh, country in the world have thought, have those sort of antecedent or have those sort of, let's say, demographic uh, indicators which supported that. And that is the reason Kenya is Kenya and, and while other countries are trying to play a catch up, but then there is only one ambassador. Yeah, and I'm going to add two seconds too. Some countries have changed the regulation to protect their banks and their financial institutions to develop their mobile money products in order so it doesn't happen what happened in Kenya. So, you know, so in, in some countries is the regulatory bodies that have that have shaped the market. So, 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 so mobile money doesn't take that, that big of importance and, and it protects in a way their banking institutions in Latin America, that's basically the case. 
no absolutely yeah and more so when your government regulators central bank everybody is intertwined that is where they have to protect the let's say the market share or the interest of the incumbents <laughs> yes <laughs> that's true guys th thank you so much we're going to have to wrap, wrap, wrap up you. there we've actually run out of time but thank you so much for your input it's been very very interesting informative for myself and i'm sure for everyone else uh, so thank you for attending this panel session a big thanks to our panelists uh, we hope you found the session useful our next panel will be starting today at 1 30 at 13 30 gmt plus one and it'll be on new tech and old businesses exploring the new products that are redefining best in class uh, tomorrow, uh, our first discussion will be remittances to Pakistan, financial inclusion and growth of digital economy. And that will start at 8.30 a.m. at GMT plus one, with several, several other panels uh, running from 10 a.m. as well. Uh, make sure you don't miss them. Uh, if you want to uh, uh, review uh, what has been discussed today, we'll be providing a written summary and video upload of all today's sessions at www.remit1.com and in our next remittance news newsletter. So please keep an eye out for that. Lastly, thanks again, everyone. And please get in touch if there's anything you'd like to discuss regarding the session today or Remit 1. Yes. Thank you very Thank much, you guys. Very much. Thank you, Thank guys. You. Thanks, Osama. Bye. Thanks for your you. lovely talk, sharing the screen with you. Bye-bye. Same thing here. Bye-bye.